Hey everyone, welcome to Eye to Eye. CBS journalist Richard Butler was freed last week after spending two months in captivity in the southern Iraqi city of Basra. He told Alan Pizzi about his dramatic rescue in his first interview since returning home. Well, let's start off at the beginning, Richard. Tell me, why did you go to a place like Basra that's in chaos? Why go there to shoot a story? Um, well, from August 2007 till December 2007, uh, I was in Basra working on a story for 60 Minutes with Lara Logan. Um, and we had built relationships with people within the Madi army that said that they could provide us with security and access to the areas that we wanted to get to and the stories that we wanted to report on. And our experience of that uh, project was that they could deliver. And from that story, came the opportunity to travel to Najaf and meet with Sheikh Salah Abadi, who's Chief of Staff to Muqtada al-Sada. And we wanted to be able to speak to Muqtada, find out exactly what his point of view was. Um, and so we chose the route through Basra to travel to Najaf. And that's uh, the story I was on when the kidnapping happened. What kind of security arrangements were in place when you were actually taken? Uh, we had exactly the same Madi Army uh, general, if that's what you can call him, uh, actually with us the whole time, and he was in the room, the hotel room that we had. So there, there are three of you in a room in Basra thinking that you're on track for what you want to do, everything is fine, the security is just like it was before, and the door bursts open, right? Um, I don't think it burst open. I, I mean, I was actually asleep when when uh, they came into the room. Earlier, we'd, an hour or so earlier, we'd had Madi Army people come into the room, check us out, speak to our Madi Army minder, and had gone away quite happy. So initially, I just thought it was more of the same. And then, as soon as I showed them my passport, everything changed. Changed in what way? They were all wearing police fatigue uniforms and armed with AK-47s. Uh, two of them had balaclavas over their head with just the eye holes and the mouthpiece. One of them grabbed me and frog marched me down the stairs. We were, you know, we were on the second floor. Frog marched me down the stairs quite quickly out into the street and into a waiting police four by four. What were you thinking at that stage? What was going through your mind? Um, this isn't good. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> yeah, I knew this was not good. Um, so then the focus for me was to try and not allow the situ situation to escalate, to keep it calm, not antagonize them in any way and, and to be um, submissive without appearing to be completely petrified. No small feat. No, no, but from my experience it's, it's best not to um, let them show them that you're too scared because they lose respect for you. How do you keep from, is, is your natural instinct to fight and how do you keep from doing that? Um, no, my natural instinct's not to fight because you're looking to buy extensions to your life in very small increments at the beginning, you know, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, two minutes, an hour, a day, a week. So you build it up in increments. The, obviously, the initial moment is crucial. If you can get past the first 60 seconds, it gives you a chance to actually build a relationship, make a connection as a human being. How did you try to do that? Um, I think you, initially you do it, as I say, by not antagonising them. You don't raise the tone of your voice to them. Um, you you have to appear as if you know you want to help them, and Did then you then you build from there. So, do you think these guys were policemen? They were policemen, acting on whose orders could you tell? Well, <clears throat> you have to understand that. Um, a situation in Basra 
is that all the police were recruited from the different Shia parties' militias. You know, the British Army went to these people and asked them for volunteers. So, you know, every policeman in Basra is probably also with one of the militia, be it Madi Army, Fadila, Hezbollah of Iraq, Badakor. They're all represented. So you couldn't tell who had you or what they were doing? No. I mean, I have, I have um, some idea. I mean, I have no way to verify it. Um, you know, while I was being held, especially initially, I heard an awful lot of Hezbollah propaganda video being played um, and a lot of Hezbollah ringtones on their mobile phones. <clears throat> um, but the complexity of the way the um, militias and the parties are in Basra it doesn't doesn't actually mean they were Hezbollah. They could have sympathies towards Hezbollah or um, reasons to have that without being Hezbollah. I mean, Hezbollah are seen as you know, the, the shining torch, if you like, amongst the Arab fightings. So you, they, you don't know what, why they took you, what they wanted in, in exchange for you, what did they want? Um, no, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know the motivation for it. I don't know how it came to be that um, you know, they, they targeted us in the hotel. Um, I do think that they were looking for a quick solution I don't think they really were prepared for the Mahdi army to, to come out and say this is wrong for Muqtadr al-Sadr himself to put out the word straight away that, you know, this is wrong, he's a journalist, we want him released. I think they might have backed themselves into a corner that they couldn't see an easy way out of. So then you just sat in the corner until something happened? Yes, yeah. And that something was serendipitous? Yes, yes, it was, um, and it was very dramatic. Tell me how that happened. I mean, you were sitting with all manacled up, hearing a firefight around you, and then Actually, what happened? Actually, the reports that I was manacled up when I was rescued wasn't true. Um, I was hooded, but I, they'd taken my handcuffs off me to let me eat my two boiled eggs. Um, and I'd also used the, uh, the toilet, and he'd put me back in, in the room, um, and went off to do something else and locked the door and he hadn't bothered putting my handcuffs back on. Um, and literally, can't have been two minutes later, all of a sudden, I heard a knock at the perimeter gate to the house, which was a metal gate, and I heard voices which very quickly raised in tempo and then gunfire just everywhere. I heard doors being kicked in, lots and lots of gunfire, um, you know, like three or four, maybe five or six AK-47s on full automatic, running on full chat. And then all of a sudden my door burst open. I don't even remember them unlocking it. It was just as if they kicked it in. And straight away there was I was aware of someone came through the room with an AK-47. I could make out the form of somebody with an AK-47 who was shouting at me. And I was aware then of another person, a taller man coming into the room, and they were shouting at me. So I tried to say, I'm, I'm hostage, British, British. And I pulled my balaclava off. And to my right, there was a taller Iraqi soldier with um, a bandana on and he got it straight away and he said something and pushed the other soldiers AK-47 away from aiming at my head and he pulled me up and he put his body around me to shield me as we ran out of the house and down the corridor and he was firing with his left hand the whole time with his AK-47 and there were other people in the house firing AK-47s and the bullets were ricocheting off the walls coming back past and it was out the house into the, like a courtyard through the gate. 
then up the street, and the street was lined with Iraqi soldiers all firing suppression fire. Um, and then there were other Iraqi soldiers trying to grab me, and this one soldier wouldn't let them take me until he got me to his general. And then he handed me over to the general. You must have thought that I survived all this, and here comes the end. I didn't actually, no. I mean, I, I didn't really get a chance to think about it until I was in the Humvee. Um, you know, just how close and how dangerous that could have been. It was The adrenaline was just running then as I went up that street. What did you think when they burst through the door? Do you think it's execution time? Um, no. I didn't know it was the Iraqi army, but I thought it could be another militia group. You didn't think out of the frying pan into the fire? I didn't really have time. It was very, very quick. Very quick. They're very lucky the guy the, got it, as you say. Yeah, he got it, and he also understood that the risk wasn't over until I was with his general. He wasn't going to let any of the other Iraqi soldiers who I, I think probably outranked him, he wouldn't let them take me because everyone wanted to take control of me as soon as they saw I was a Westerner. Just one last, one last thing, really, that... Having, I was in Baghdad when you were being held, and so I know the concerns that went around and how we all felt and worried and thought about you. Um, were you in any, did you any, in any way have any sense that, that you were not forgotten, or did you, really, did you feel abandoned at any point? Um, I knew I wouldn't be f forgotten. Um, you know, I know that the, you know, the media is a very close family, particularly in war zones. I mean, people think we do it for the adrenaline, which has got nothing to do with it at all. Because as you know, it's 99% boredom anyway. Um, you know, and if you want an adrenaline kick, there are far more realistic ways to go get it than go what we do. Um, we do it because of the relationship we have with the people we work with. Um, you know, it's a close community. And when the chips are down, everyone pulls together. So I knew I wouldn't be forgotten by the media. I knew CBS in particular, who have a reputation for looking after their people, would never ever forget me. Um, and obviously I knew my family wouldn't. Um, but I, the few times that I was able to get the World Service, I was actually relieved not to be hearing my name. Um, because A, I knew that level of publicity would just cause more distress to my family and friends. Um, second thing, it would elevate my value in the eyes of my kidnappers. Um, and thirdly, it obviously remind me of my predicament, so I was pleased not to be hearing that. And of course the other thing, it's very unprofessional in, in our profession to actually become the story. Well, if it's any consolation, Richard, we know you didn't do it on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> thanks very much.